Okay. <clears throat> so, good to see you all this evening. Um, did you manage to get through chapter two? Yes. Great. A lot to talk about there. In fact, sometimes <laughs> I realize there's just that there are so many ways that you could get into what might be being said that I can't possibly cover all of them. It's just not. So I'd, I'd like to keep this reading group relatively light and enjoyable without going too far down the rabbit hole. Maybe sometimes that's okay. Um, but there really is just, there's so much there and there are so many things. And eventually you find yourself uh, looking really closely at some detail and asking whether you're just chasing shadows. <laughs> is there really something behind this little sentence or this turn of phrase? And then other times there are things that really clearly seem to be intentionally placed there and should be commented upon. Um, let me just get this thing started. Okay. <laughs> Just a sec. Ah, here we go. Okay. So, uh, chapter two. begins with our heroine leaving on her journey. She left Kinneret right away. Kinneret. I don't know if you guys looked up Kinneret or Kinnereth. It's uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and also possibly a few other locations. So it's already got a biblical overtone. Kinneret is uh, the Sea of Galilee is said to be where Jesus preached a lot of his sermons around that area. Um, so how are we to interpret that? Or are we to interpret that at all? <laughs> Is she leaving the Holy Land? Is she going into the darkness? Something like that. Maybe. So she left Kinneret then. There's no idea she was moving toward anything new. Uh, she explains to her husband, Mucho, that she is going off to Narciso or Narciso. I'm not sure. Uh, we'll talk about that because there's certainly something going on there. Uh, mucho mas, enigmatic, whistling. I want to kiss your feet. So that's obviously, at least I think, obviously a reference to the Beatles, which would be really appropriate to the time period that this book was published in. Uh, I want to hold your hand is the Beatles song a new recording by Sick Dick and the Volkswagens. There were so many bands back then that had these something, something, and the somethings <laughs> as a this pattern for the name. Uh, and there are still plenty of those around, actually. An English group he was fond of at the time, but did not believe in. Now, repetition is becoming more and more of a, a thing that is popping up in the story. I'm sure you guys have noticed this phrase uh, being fond of, but not believing in. And then later on the phrase that sad, but not desperate that that comes up multiple times. So there's this thing with repetition that is becoming an issue. Well, not an issue, but it's certainly something we'll probably find ways to comment upon. Um, so yeah. English group he was fond of at the time, but did not believe in, uh, stood with hands and pockets while she explained about going down to San Narciso uh, for a while to look into Pierce's books and records and confer with Metzger, the co-executor. So co-executor would be the other person named to execute this will. In other words, to execute the affairs of the estate of Pierce. Okay. Mucho was sad to see her go, but not desperate. So after telling him to hang up, if Dr. Hilarious called, if Dr. Hilarious calls, hang up. <laughs> it's good advice. Call and uh, look after the oregano in the garden, which had contracted a strange mold. 
she went. So uh, she goes off to San Narciso. Now that San Narciso, so there is, of course, uh, there is a Saint Narcissus. Actually, there are a couple of them. Um, there's the original one who lived to be very old. And uh, then there's another one. I don't know if this is going to come up later because I still haven't finished the book. I know it's only <laughs> not even 200 pages, but I've just been busy. Um, I don't know if it's going to come up later, but there's, a, there's one uh, Catalan saint, Narciso, who is this patron saint of biting insects. And there's a legend around him that uh, when the French tried to invade uh, this city, uh, I forget which city, in Catalonia, that uh, a swarm of flies defended the city that came from uh, the, it's uh, apparently the, the corpse of Saint Narcissus is there uh, in an incorrupted state, but that's where the flies came from and defended the city and there are like three times that it happened. So in that city in Catalonia, you'll find that there are giant concrete flies on the walls <laughs> that people have put there. I'm not sure if that's gonna come up, the thing with the biting insects, but one thing is definitely gonna come up and that is Narcissus, uh, the, the Roman mythological figure, uh, Narcissus and Echo. Uh, and of course, the idea of, well, who is the narcissist in the story? I don't know exactly, but I think I do. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. Who do you guys think is, is being referred to as the narcissist? Anyone? I think maybe, maybe the main character or Deepa Mas uh, uh, is um, some kind of narcissist. Maybe in that way that uh, she uh, want to, uh, how to say, uh, overcome uh, uh, her um, nature of uh, domestic wife and uh, uh, maybe uh, she has some uh, narcissistic courage that she must be something very special and she uh, tried to uh, how to say uh, find uh, a new life and to support uh, her narcissistic nature in uh, this uh, 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 attempt to succeed the how to say, sure. higher level of in the sun uh, to be something special and to be maybe I don't know maybe something okay perhaps did you have something to add Vasilia? Oh well maybe uh, when he say uh, San Narciso uh, he means on the society of uh, California Society of uh, Conformity is that oh California Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. No, I think that's a, that's that's good as well. Uh, I have my own theory, but I think those are both very good. Yeah, California for sure. My God. Uh, <laughs> I mean, L.A. gets mentioned right in the same sentence. Uh, let's not even get started with that. That's like the epicenter of the of global narcissism. <laughs> anyway. Um, there's also the fact that Pierce is sort of owns everything and bought everything. And well, there's later on going to be some pointing towards uh, Oedipa as Echo, right? I mean, they're former lovers, uh, but we'll see as we go forward. So San Narciso lay further south near LA, like many named places in California. It was less an identifiable city than a grouping of concepts. So what do you guys make of that? Why would we call a city, not a city, but a grouping of concepts? I included this uh, zoning, this sample of a zoning map next to, next to this paragraph to maybe kind of give an idea of that because in a zoning map, uh, areas are defined by the types of things that will be there. Um, so census tracts, special purpose bond issue districts, shopping nuclei, 
all overlaid with access roads to its own freeway. So groupings of concepts. So this is an indication that this, this town, if you want to call it the city, if you want to call it that, is highly planned, right? On paper, there are a bunch of concepts outlining the city. Yes, Vasilya? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I saw to say, uh, uh, like their uh, quarters, qu uh, quarts, like uh, quarters, uh -huh. quarters uh, in the city, and uh, but that's same as the group. That's certainly true. Uh, I think what th that's uh, that's definitely true. But I think what perhaps what is being said here is that the city is highly highly planned out by by concepts. Uh, it's this city began with a lot of theory behind it. Uh, contrast that with other cities and towns that popped up organically, right? People lived there and things developed just out of necessity. Footpaths became sidewalks. <laughs> uh, some footpaths became roads and that was the city. But this place has been conceptualized. Mm. I think that the, most of all, he wanted to criticize that this is his criticism of the modern world or modern cities. I think that the, I've only read half of the first chapter. I'm sorry to say this, but I think that uh, the book is underlying criticism of all things modern. Oh, that's certainly true. I would agree with that 100%. Um, and there is the thing about well, from what I understand of Thomas Pinchon, he has kind of, he considers himself a real Californian, but he also has issues with it. <laughs> yes, uh, I think this is his own preferences mm -hmm. about how things should look like and be like. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, and we're going to see more of that right away. Uh, she looked, as she comes into the city, and she looks down a hill, the slope, Winting for the sunlight onto a vast sprawl of houses which had grown up all together like well-tended crop uh, from the dull brown earth. And she thought of the time she'd open a transistor radio to replace a battery and seen her first printed circuit. So a printed circuit, if you guys aren't sure what that refers to, is... Graphic kaput uh, in Serbian. Right. Well, month... Uh -huh. Well, you said motherboard, right? Uh, no, not motherboard. Uh, uh -huh. It's a, a graphical plot. It's a bit different. It's a circuit. It's a... Well, I, I'm going to have a picture of one in a second. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like this. <laughs> strike circuit, yes. Right. Um, so this is, uh, th there's a lot to think about here, I would say. Uh, she looks at the city and sees it like this, like this could look like a, a little city here, this picture. Can I say something? Of... Yes, of course. Uh, this is my profession. I made the, those circuits. Okay. And it's really like uh, projecting some city or some architectural, architectural uh, problem. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that struck me even when I was very little kid uh, about these kinds of circuits. Um, and I imagined little people living in the cities. And then there was a, a film in the 1980s called Tron, science fiction movie. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Um, in that movie, uh, a scientist is transported into a computer and it turns out there are people living in, in there. <laughs> there are little beings that live in there. Uh, and that was endlessly fascinating to me. Um, so yeah, she looks down the hill and she sees something like this, this circuit board. Uh, it says she knew even less about radios than about Southern Californians, uh, though she knew less about radios than Southern Californians. There were, uh, to both, outward patterns, a hieroglyphic sense of concealed meaning. Now, this really struck me. Um, Sometimes you can look at an object and see that there is some, some potential to interpret or derive meaning or information out of it. 
I mean, imagine, of course, we all know what this circuit board looks like because it's it's the one we're familiar with, but imagine finding something like an alien circuit board <laughs> and and realizing that it's something, right? And there's there's something that can be gotten from it. You know not what, because it's completely alien knowledge. And that's kind of how she, th this, this phrase, hieroglyphic sense of concealed meaning, there's something hiding just beneath the surface. There's some meaning that she's seeking after, that thing that she's chasing after. Um, so this is uh, what she's questing for, presumably. An intent to communicate. The city means to tell her something. She gets the feeling that there's something there to be learned, to be communicated. Uh, there seemed to be no limit to what the printed circuit could have told her if she had tried to find out. So in her first minute of San Narciso, uh, a revelation also trembled just past the threshold of her understanding. Revelation, again, I would say intentionally religious choice of words, revelation, like uh, revelation, otkrivanje, is that it in Serbian? Like re revelation. What is it? In, in the... And may I say the translation of Princess Circle is Stampa no Kolo. Of yes, which one? You're right. Of Princess Circuit. The translation uh -huh. of Printed Circuit is oh. Stampa no Kolo. Yes, yes. That's a, it's literally all Kolo like circuit. Yes, Stampa no Kolo. <laughs> yes. Okay. Because a circuit can go round and round, or in English, that term can mean either something that goes around and around or uh, something that goes into in a complicated pattern, circuitous, winding. Um, so in any case, she sees the city and it's like looking at a circuit board that has something to tell her, uh, something that was, again, a circuit board is heavily planned, just as we were talking about before, the groups of concepts. When you think about putting a circuit board together, as I'm sure that you, Yelena, can attest to, uh, it is sort of groups of concepts <laughs> in a way, right? You have this processor over here, you have capacitors over there, um, and so on. Now, the reason this struck me was the, the concept of psychogeography. Now, this is a slight aside that's purely mine that I'm inserting here. Are you guys familiar with the concept of uh, the city has something to tell you, and if you wander through it appropriately, you can find that message. Uh, it's a uh, kind of an aesthetic judgment thing. Uh, is anybody familiar with this? We're not gonna go long on this, but uh, the idea that, uh, yeah, the city has something to say. Uh, this comes from the situationists, sort of a, I don't know, pseudo kind of, uh, avant-garde, uh, sort of leftist sort of artist who uh, would wander through Paris drifting, they said. The drift was when you wandered through the city, uh, following the city's prompts, following the kind of the feeling, the way that the city is drawing you forward, and you get uh, something out of that. You get sort of a message. Um, I kind of in just included this other picture. <laughs> what is the message? Well, we're going to find out. Um, smog hung all around the horizon. The sun on the bright uh, beige countryside was painful. Hmm. She and the Chevy seemed parked at the center of an odd religious instant. So I could almost picture this like a... <laughs> religious painting with her looking down the hill at the city as if on some other frequency or out of the eye of some whirlwind rotating too slow for her heated skin uh, even to feel the centrifugal coolness of her words sorry coolness of sorry words were being spoken so she feels as if somewhere just out just beyond her hearing just beyond the range of her hearing words are being spoken right 
Now this ties very nicely to those uh, sort of the idea of, of paranoia, <laughs> which will come up more and more. Um, as the religious instant ends, she drives forward and it says there are you know just endless fences and the addresses have run to extremely high numbers and the tens of thousands and it feels unnatural. She passes a gate with two 60-foot missiles on either side and the name Yoyodyne lettered conservatively on each nose cone. This is pretty, uh, let's say, it's, it's, it's current, let's say. This is something that, that is an issue these days. Uh, not the existence of uh, giant missiles on either side of a gate, but uh, the idea that... Uh, Okay, so this is one of those, this is the Galactronics division of Yoyodyne, one of the giants of the aerospace industry. Pierce owned a large block of shares in Yoyodyne, uh, and he had been involved in negotiating and understanding with the county tax assessor to lure Yoyodyne there in the first place. So uh, this is something that happens a lot in the U.S., uh, there are situations in which large companies say, oh, we're going to open up a, a factory or something like that, or uh, a fulfillment center. And then all of the uh, cities in the US trip over themselves to try to make conditions as bad as possible for workers in order to lure the company over. <laughs> so we can presume that Pierce is uh, basically telling them that, uh, well, the, the, the tax assessor, like, hey, why don't you just overlook charging taxes on Yo-Yo Dine and they'll, they'll come here? Uh, I'm, yeah, companies do that here. Oh, it's from Elizabeth. Hello. I didn't see you there. Uh, companies do that here in Serbia as well these days. Yeah. It's a, uh, there's a lot of it about. <laughs> Jason, uh, uh, can you repeat what is uh, lure? What is what? What is meaning of lure? What that means? A lure. Uh, lure is to attract. Right. So the idea is that uh, a city might loosen safety regulations, for example, safety regulations for workers. And that might make a city more appealing to a large company that doesn't want to spend extra money on worker safety. <laughs> you know, things like worker safety. Um, so yeah. In this case, it's uh, uh, the fact that San Narciso will just, uh, you know, let Yo-Yo Dine slide on paying some taxes, most likely. Also, there's, if you think about the name, Yo-Yo Dine, there's something to it. You know, the yo-yo, this toy that goes up and down. Uh, yo-yo Dine, I'm thinking of Dyna like dynamo, like power. Yo-Yo Dine, like power up and down. I don't know. Um, if this is a weapons producing company. Uh, now I'm probably reading too deeply into this. So this is what happens when you start thinking too much about th these little things like this. I was thinking about this today saying, well, yeah, you know, in order for a company like that to continue to survive, it would have to be sure that the powers rise, that the powers rose and fell, but were never destroyed completely and never succeeded entirely. <laughs> Otherwise, the market for weapons would dry up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they have to keep things going like a yo-yo. Um, when she got to the next motel, she hesitated a second. A representation in painted sheet metal of a nymph uh, holding a white blossom towered 30 feet into the air, lit up despite the sun, said Echo Quartz. Okay, so this is what I was getting at. Uh, Narcissus and Echo is this. Uh, these are mythological uh, characters. I'm sure you guys have probably heard the story of Narcissus and Echo. And this is uh, why I suspect that Pierce is the narcissist because Pierce has his name on everything and he's kind of built this whole reality that they're 
uh, venturing into. He's almost a godlike figure. He's built everything. He owns everything uh, in this Narcissus town. <laughs> and Echo, Echo is the name of the nymph who fell in love with Narcissus in the store in the uh, in the mythological story. Narcissus, of course, fell in love with his own reflection. Uh, Echo had been cursed for previous uh, misdeeds <laughs> to only be able to say the last part of someone's sentence back to them, right? So she couldn't communicate. Um, yes. Yeah, Nevena, can you can you mute your mic? I think that's your. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, okay. Um, so yeah, I feel like I might be wrong too. I, I feel like Oedipa is our echo, um, because she was the lover of Pierce. Um, now in all fairness, the, every character here so far has some degree of narcissism to them. So there's that. <laughs> uh, I think just the the power and ambition of Pierce kind of puts him in a class above, perhaps. So yeah, uh, there's also a, a part when she first walks into the hotel, I didn't put this part up here, but the first thing she sees is a large reflecting pool, which really kind of strikes you as a reference to the, to the, to the mythological story. Uh, because Narciss, Narcissus, uh, just stared into a pool all day at his own reflection, saying, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Why won't you pay attention to me? Um, yeah, there's a painting of the figures themselves. <clears throat> uh, the face of the nymph was much like Oedipus. So there it is. I mean, they're, they're saying, look, she looks like, she looks like Echo. Um, which didn't startle her so much as a, conce a concealed blower system that kept the nymph's gauze chitin in constant agitation. That's like a robe. So the robe is being animated by a large, by a large fan or something, a blower system. Um, so as she's stepping into the hotel, <laughs> she meets Miles, who's the manager, who's 16 years old. <laughs> I put this picture of, anybody know who this is? <laughs> it's Ringo Starr. Come on, guys. The drummer for the Beatles. Um, I just thought he, when I read about Miles and his lapel-less, cuff-less, one-button mohair suit, I immediately thought of, of Ringo Starr for some reason. He's the one that popped into my head. I don't know why. I think because Ringo was the, probably the most unassuming or kind of goofy member of the band. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so yeah, she meets Miles. Uh, he's singing to himself, too fat to frog. That's what you tell me all the time. It turns out uh, frog and swim here are references to dances that were popular, um, even though they sound like they're references to something much more uh, uh, not foul. I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Too fat to do this dance. To frog. Too fat to frog. That's what you tell me all the time when you're really trying to put me down. But I'm hip. So close your big fat lip. Yeah, baby, I may be too fat to frog, but at least I ain't too slim to swim. So this is his silly song that he's singing to himself or maybe to her as she gets into the hotel. Um, by the way, uh, I didn't really put it up here. Hang on a sec. Did I? No, I didn't put it up here. Uh, he, she offers to uh, perhaps submit a tape of his band because he's in a band, right? Um, he's in a band and in the band, they all pretend to be British and he does this British accent because it's supposed to make them more popular. She says, my husband's a DJ. Maybe you could give me a tape and I could put it on the air. He immediately believes that she's coming on to him that she's like propositioning him that's his first thought 
And he's like, oh, what can I help you with? And she, she immediately grabs an antenna to fend him off with. <laughs> um, and then he goes, everyone hates me. <laughs> no, he goes, you hate me too. That's what he says. Um, so then Metzger, the co-executor, shows up. Uh, that night, the lawyer Metzger showed up. Metzger, by the way, German for butcher. Uh, that seems to actually get some play in some a few parts here. Uh, he turned out to be so good looking that Oedipa thought at first that somebody up there were putting her on. Putting her on means playing a joke on her. It had to be an actor. She couldn't believe it. She'd be like, how can this guy be this good looking? Uh, anybody know who this, this fellow in the picture is? Is it Paul Newman? It is Paul Newman. Paul Newman when he was really young. <laughs> yeah, he was quite the player back then. Yeah. Um, yeah, she says, this can't be real. How can this guy be this attractive? And he's just the co-executor that I'm working with. Uh, Metzger really <laughs> kind of oddly immediately opens up to her to a, a ridiculous extent. And there's so much in this book that happens uh, in such an odd way. And this is one of the things that somebody would just open up completely like this and immediately start talking about their mother <laughs> and like some really sort of personal stuff. Some 20 odd years ago, Metzger had been one of those child movie stars performing under the name of Baby Igor. Uh, my mother, he announced bitterly, was really out to cash me boy like a piece of beef on the sink. She wanted to drain me and white. Okay, so. I had to like dig a little bit for this cashier thing. It turns out it's uh, when food, this is another spelling of kosher. Uh, in Judaism, uh, kosher food has been specially treated while well, meat has been specially prepared to be kosher. And in that process, uh, the blood is drained from the animal completely first. So, he, that is the reference he's making. She was really out to bleed me dry, like a piece of beef on the sink. She wanted me drained and white. Um, and see that that also plays with the name Metzger. Well, he's the butcher, but he was also the piece of meat. I don't know. Again, we might just be being trolled by the author. <laughs> um, sometimes I think so. Sometimes, sometimes it seems there's definitely something at play. Other times I think it's just... To, to drive us a bit crazy. Um, Oedipa turns on the TV and immediately there's a movie with baby Igor, him as a child. So it's just wildly coincidental. This is that paranoia. This is like a cosmic paranoia. How can this be happening, right? She shows up at a hotel. The co-executor shows up, immediately tells this story about himself as a child actor and she turns on the TV and the first thing that's on television is him as a child actor. So it's, it's wildly perhaps paranoia inducing <laughs> you at that point, you'd have to think this could be one of those prank television shows with the hidden camera. This could be <laughs> Alan Funt. Where are you? Okay. You guys, <laughs> anybody know who Alan Funt was? <laughs> um, <laughs> He was a hidden camera show host uh, back in the day in the U.S. Um, onto the screen bloomed the screen bloomed the image of a child of indeterminate sex, its bare legs pressed awkwardly to get awkward together, not awkward together, not awkwardly. Uh, its shoulder-length curls mingling with the shorter hair of a Saint Bernard, that's a dog, uh, whose long tongue, as Oedipa watched, began to swipe at the child's rosy cheeks, making the child wrinkle up his nose appealingly and say, oh, Murray, come on, now you're getting me all wet. So they turn on the TV, they see baby Igor being licked by a giant dog. Uh, and he says, that's me, that's me, good God. Which one, asked Oedipa. <laughs> it's funny, right? <clears throat> Got a sharp tongue. Which one? The movie was called, and he goes, cashiered. Now think about this, uh, the movie's called Cashiered and he had just said that his mother was out to cashier me. <clears throat> the words are very close. Um, now I should add also cashier, 
as a verb. Now, uh, okay. Hmm. When someone is cashiered, they're taken out of the military for, they're, they're uh, expelled from the military. It's called being cashiered. So that's what this movie name is in reference to. Um, there is a verb to cashier. And this isn't, yeah, I guess it would be an adjective because it's just this, uh, you know, third column verb, the past participle, like broken window. All right, we're not going to go down a grammar rabbit hole. <laughs> Cashiered is the description of the person who's the main character in the movie. And so, yeah, so she naturally says about you and your mother, because he said she was out to cashier me, which would sound the same. Of course, they, she doesn't see the word cashiered on the, the screen or anything. She just hears cashiered. Oh, about you and your mother. Uh, see, misheard things, misunderstood things. He says, no, it's about this kid and his father who's drummed out of the British army, drummed out as being expelled. Uh, imagine them solemnly playing drums as the, as the ashamed soldier marches away. Who's drummed out of the British army for cowardice. Uh, only he's covering up for a friend, see? And to redeem himself, he and the kid follow the old regiment to Gallipoli, where father somehow builds a midget submarine. And every week they slip through the Dardanelles uh, into the Sea of Marmara and torpedo the Turkish merchantmen, uh, the father, the son, and the St. Bernard. I don't know if that's meant to be <laughs> the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the dog sits on periscope watch so that's like the dog is looking through the periscope to see if there's anyone out there and he barks if he sees anything Oedipus was pouring wine you're kidding <laughs> uh there's a, a thing that's going to keep happening that that's really funny they place a bet of course uh of course Metzger has to know so basically she he's asking her to make a bet on whether the trio of characters in the movie will make it, like we'll have a happy ending, if the film will have a happy ending in general. I mean, there, there are comments that it, the film contains the possible seeds of a happy ending because there's a, a woman that could be the love interest for the father. There's a cute little girl who's friends with uh, the son. And there's even a girl dog back at the port that the St. Bernard is making eyes at. So it, all the makings are there for a, a sort of cheesy Hollywood happy ending. And he wants her to bet on whether they'll make it. Um, she's reluctant to do so, but eventually she does take the bet. Um, now, I put this part up to, because I, this is the first time I noticed it happening. <clears throat> But Metzger seems to switch between treating this memory as if it were the memory of making a movie or between that and uh, a memory of something that actually happened. Notice the way that this is phrased. Uh, so just before this part, he says that, uh, that, that Jerry, by the way, if you guys notice that he says Jerry put down a giant net, Jerry was slang back in the day for Germans. He said Jerry had put down a giant net in, in the sea and the submarines, uh, well, it was there to stop submarines. The net was made from two inch thick cables. Um, and the character in the movie, the guy playing his father, well, his father in the movie, uh, says, well, the first thing we should do is dive the submarine down to get under the net. This is the part I haven't put up. That's just leading up to this. Metzger says, that's ridiculous. They'd built a gate into it so German U-boats could get through to attack the British fleet. All our E-class subs simply used that gate. Remember, he's in this movie, right? Uh, Oedipus says, how do you know that? And he says, wasn't I there? You see what I mean? <laughs> Were you there making a movie? Yes. But in the movie, there's nothing about this gate. So he, he seems to sort of switch 
his memory for a, a real memory of actually being in a submarine or at least knowing about the British fleet and the E-class subs. Um, and I, it looks like Oedipus starts to object because she naturally responds, but, <laughs> but then she gets sidetracked. But then she saw they were out of wine. Aha, said Metzger. From inside a coat pocket, he pulled out a bottle of tequila. So they're getting very drunk. Um, they continue talking. And there's this interesting story about uh, how he, he was a lawyer, or sorry, he was an actor and became a lawyer. But lawyers, when they get up to persuade the jury, becomes an actor. So there's this reversal of roles. By the way, I, I don't want to over dominate this. If you guys have something to add, please let me know. Um, uh, yes, Vasilye. Well, uh, Matt, he, he was uh, he uh, memory uh, from the film and from the reality uh, was. Uh, uh, it it wasn't clear to him, and uh, he uh, for the film he claimed that it was reality and something like something like that. Uh, yeah, he's either not clear, or he's intentionally doing something. Uh, and uh, in the like, if he was in the submarine, in what submarine he was in German or British? Well, I think, I don't know. I, I think it would be that sub that his, that the character in the movie built. So in the movie, the father from that trio somehow builds a small submarine. Um, and that, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he was in the war and that's where the memory part is coming from. Um, yeah, it's a good question. His name is German. <laughs> Who's, whose subs were you in, sir? Daddy, what did you do during the war? Um, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. It's uh, either he's being deceptive or it could be just Thomas Pinchon messing with us in making us go crazy uh, because there's not Yeah, I mean, this is not narrated by uh, Oedipa. You know, it's omniscient narration. So I don't know. It's something to think about. I, I, I don't know. Really, it happens again, by the way. You're going to see it happen here in a, in a minute. Not in this part, but he has this interesting talk, though, about, uh, yeah, a lawyer in a courtroom becomes an actor, right? Raymond Burr. Raymond Burr is uh, the actor who, uh, yo, I, now I can't remember his name. <laughs> the actor who plays the lawyer we talked about last time um, from television. Ah, uh, uh, why is it slipping my mind right now? Yeah, it'll come to me as soon as I stop thinking about it. Raymond Burr is the actor who plays the lawyer from last time that we talked about. Uh, yeah, Raymond Burr is an actor impersonating a lawyer who goes in front of the jury to become an actor. This multiple switching of characters. Me, I'm a former actor who became a lawyer. Then he goes on to say that they're making a TV series about him, about his career. <laughs> and his friend, Manny Depresso, not going to think about that name right now, <laughs> a one time lawyer. So the guy who's playing him also used to be a lawyer, quit his firm to become an actor, okay, who in the, pli in the pilot plays me, an actor, become a lawyer, who occasionally becomes an actor in front of the jury. <laughs> um, so there's just so much mirroring there. He says, then, the film is in an air-conditioned vault at one of the Hollywood studios. Light can't fatigue it. It can be repeated endlessly. Um, so that's important for him to say, apparently, uh, that this image of him can be repeated and repeated. Yes, did somebody say something? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's interesting. Do you guys have some comments about that? Uh, I'm I'm Sorry? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, Vasilia? Uh, Ronaldo, uh, uh, Ryan Burr, he uh, plays and a lawyer, uh, uh, uh Roman Manson. Sorry? Um, uh, Raymond Burr, he yeah. plays a uh, lawyer, uh, in a movie, uh, with, uh, Roseman. Mason. Oh, Perry Mason. Perry Mason. Yes. Perry oh. Mason is the lawyer. That's right. It, I, it just slipped my mind. It's something I should know. <laughs> I mean, those those shows are from... I get one question. Okay. You seem to have frozen. Go ahead. Can I ask you something? Yes. Uh, so this uh, means uh, some connection with Adip comics, or is some uh, independent, uh, like just uh, we, we read that Adip, or uh, there, there is no, uh, how to say, um, connection? And the uh, connection with the meat about Narcissus. What is the connection? Is there some... Uh, oh, is there a connection between that? meat and Narcissus? Um, I think if I put my mind to it, I could make one. <laughs> but I don't know. If, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if... I don't know if the... I, I, I don't feel compelled to. Let's just say that. <laughs> I mean... Maybe if we find some more justification for that later. I don't think that every single thing is inter interconnected, right? Like the meat parts, uh, unless we want to just say something like the meat is the flesh and the uh, narcissus is looking at the image, which is corporeal or something like that, you know, like the because Narcissus is in love with the image, but he believes the image is another person. Um, but the beauty is physical beauty. So there could be. I'm, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not really pushed in that direction. Uh, I might be at some point. I'll think on it though. Um, so as they're going through trying to figure out what's going to happen, suddenly they realize that in the television uh, presentation of the film, Metzger says they must have got the reels screwed up. What he means there is that the film starts to appear out of order. The reels would be reels of film, like, you know, just big circles of film because suddenly that the film is not going in the right order. He says, Oh wait, this scene is in the wrong place. Um, and that's why she asks, is this before or after? Because now it's really hard for her to come up with uh, a, a guess as to whether the trio will make it to a happy ending because the story is jumbled. The story is, is confused. I mean, she started in the middle of the story anyway, but it's even more confused now. Um, so, yeah, she says, is this before or after? <clears throat> Reaching for the tequila. Uh, a move that put her left breast in the region of Metzger's nose. Uh, he says, that would be telling. Um, she says, come on, or the bet's off. Nope, says Metzger. At least tell me if that's his old regiment there. Because she's trying to figure out whether they made it to safety or not. Uh, go ahead, said Metzger. Ask questions. But for each answer, you'll have to take something off. So he's trying to get her to take her clothes off. We'll call it strip Botticelli. Botticelli is actually a word game. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. I mean, it's a regular word game with no clothes involved. 
It's like it's like twenty questions where you think of a famous person and the other person tries to figure out who it is. Um, uh, so yeah, he's they're, they're, they continue to watch the film. He says, "I know this part. This is the other thing where he seems to be confusing reality with the film." I know this part, Metzger says, his eyes squeezed shut, head away from the set. So here's a guy who knows that this is a movie <laughs> that he was in, squeezing his eyes shut, turning his head away from the TV set. He says, for 50 yards out to sea was red with blood. They don't show that. What, what do you mean? <laughs> Did it really happen when they were making the film that there was 50 yards of bloody seawater? From the coast that the cameramen don't show so again he seems to be confusing something um oedipus skipped to the bathroom so this is after she agrees to play the strip botticelli but then she she's going to cheat right so she goes into the bathroom and puts on all of her clothes every piece of clothing that she can find um <laughs> so that he would never get to the middle let's say uh, yeah, so six pairs of panties, three pairs of nylons, three bras, two pairs of stretch slacks, etc., 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 and an old Orlon Moo Moo. Um, she looks in the mirror and sees herself covered in all these clothes and immediately starts laughing. She laughs so hard she falls down and knocks a can of hairspray uh, on the sink with her. The can hits the floor. Something breaks, and the can starts shooting around the room, propelled by the pressurized gases. <laughs> um, so the, the, the hairspray can is just shooting around the room, bouncing off the walls. Uh, uh, Metzger comes in and almost gets hit by the can, uh, and they kind of fall down together. There's a part I didn't put up here that was interesting that said that uh, she realized that with some kind of computer, you could calculate every move that the can would make based on the laws of physics, but she couldn't possibly do that. All she could do was kind of keep her head down and <laughs> make, she said, it's gonna stop at some point. Um, it's basically, it's going to do what it's going to do. Uh, they make, it makes a huge mess. It breaks the mirror. Um, then uh, someone is heard to remark, blimey, <laughs> and cool. You guys know what that is? No. It's from, it's from British slang, and it's actually pretty dated these days. Blimey is it's short for blind me, uh, is an exclamation in sort of British street slang. Blimey, blind me. Uh, it was short, even that was short for God blind me. <laughs> God blind me was an exclamation that people would use. And then it was shortened to blimey. And cool is actually just a extremely far removed mispronunciation of God. Cool blimey is the full phrase. It's God blind me. Blimey, cool. So uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, the band, the band has arrived. <laughs> so the manager of the hotel with his band has shown up. And of course, they're speaking in ridiculous British slang uh, when they see the mess in the room. Oedipa was biting onto Metzger's arm. Uh, yeah, she sees Miles standing there, now multiplied by four because the other band members are there. At first, I thought it was because she was drunk. And I think that maybe it's a little bit unclear on purpose in the writing. Um, she sees four miles. She sees four miles is. <laughs> um, but then she realizes that the band is here. They've got some girls with them. And uh, they're going to play out in the courtyard of the hotel. So they plug all their extension cords, their electrical cords into the room and go outside and they start playing. Um, while they're watching the movie, periodically commercials come on. And every time a commercial comes on, Metzger informs uh, Oedipa that, oh, yeah, Pierce owned that. Oh, yeah, Pierce 
uh, thought of that. Or yeah, Pierce uh, uh, has, in this case, he says, oh no, not in this case. He said, oh yeah, that's one of Pierce's interests. So everything that comes on television in between all the commercials, all the advertisements are for things that Pierce in Verarity is involved in or owns. <laughs> and it's starting to annoy Oedipa. Uh, she says, say it once more, I'll wrap the TV tube around your head. The tube, by the way, that's just a sort of slang for the, the television. There's the vacuum tube inside of it. That's that old technology. Um, she wasn't really, after he said, you're really mad. She wasn't really. She said, what didn't he own? And he says, you tell me. Um, yeah, at that point, the Paranoids had broken into song outside. Things grew less and less clear as the drinking went on. <laughs> at some point, she went into the bathroom, tried to find her image in the mirror, and couldn't. There's a lot to think about there. Uh, couldn't find herself for a moment. Uh, she had a moment of pure terror because she couldn't find the mirror. Then she remembered that the mirror had broken and fallen in the sink. Seven years bad luck, she said aloud. I'll be 35. She shut the door behind her and took uh, the occasion to blunder almost absently into another slip and skirt, as well as long leg girdle and a couple uh, pairs of knee socks. It struck her that if the sun ever came up, Metzger would disappear. So maybe she's starting to think he's imaginary. This is still that that tags nicely onto the I, the idea that she had first thought that this is all this can't be real. <laughs> There's too much unreal about the whole scene. Uh, maybe it's a just all a kind of dream. And the sun will come up and Metzger will be gone. Um, so uh, Oedipa, Oedipa and Metzger sleep together. At the height of their escapade, the lights go out at the very moment. It was a curious experience. I love this sentence. The paranoids had blown a fuse. <laughs> so there's the phrase, blow a fuse, which can mean to lose your mind. <laughs> and just the sentence, the paranoids had blown a fuse is funny by itself. Um, like they had lost it. <laughs> but yeah, they had plugged all that electricity in. So right, you know, at the highest point of their lovemaking, the, the lights all turned out, right? Uh, when the lights came on again, uh, she and Metzger, uh, okay, they lay twined amid a wall-to-wall -wall scatter of clothing and spilled bourbon. The place is a mess. It looks like the Rolling Stones have been there. Uh, the TV tube, so the TV comes on and it's at the very end of the film. Uh, I haven't finished the book either, but I have to say that this whole scene seems like a very bad portent, like a very bad sign for the future. The lights come back on and it is the death scene of the main characters of the movie. Um, the TV tube revealed the father, dog, and baby oh. Igor uh, trapped inside the darkening Justine. By the way, Justine is the name of the father character's uh, wife who has passed on. There's a lot to think about there, just with uh, the father and the son in a little submarine named after the dead mother. <laughs> right. I mean, the submarine is really kind of, I don't know. The ocean itself, very womb-like. Anyway. Um, so yeah, they're trapped inside the darkening submarine as the water level rose. The dog was the first to drown in a great crowd of bubbles. The camera came in for a close-up of baby Igor crying, one hand on the control board. Um, and the electricity gets him. Uh, through one of those Hollywood distortions and probability, the father was spared electrocution so he could make a farewell speech. Apologizing to baby Igor and the dog for getting them into this and regretting that they wouldn't be meeting in heaven. Your little eyes have seen daddy for the last time. You are for our salvation, I am for the pit. So the film does not have the happy ending. Uh, and this is what the first thing that they see when the lights come on. This seems like bad, a bad omen. Um, also, the film subverted the typical Hollywood trope of the happy ending. I mean, of course, there were films back then that did that. Uh, 
these days there are many more. Uh, it's become more common to subvert and have a an unclear or unhappy ending. Um, but back then it would be less common to have a kind of unhappy ending like this, especially one this dark, right? In American cinema. There are certainly exceptions, but... Um, so, and by the way, Oedipa did bet that they would not make it. I don't know if I said that earlier. Perhaps I should have. But if you, if you didn't manage to read this second chapter, Oedipa took the bet and said that they would not make it. So she was right. She was right, and she gambled against the typical trope, right? She, she gambled against the conventional ending of the film, and she was right. Um, she realizes then that, well, that means that she was right all along uh, and she won. Uh, so she's kind of annoyed with Metzger at this point. <laughs> she says, you bastard, I won. You won me, he says. Uh, she says, what did Inverarity tell you about me? That you would not be easy. She began to cry. Uh, this crying, what do you guys think? I mean, to me, it seems like she knew the dice were stacked. Or she sees now that the game was, that always had always planned for her to resist, <laughs> right? That she might have considered betting that they would not make it an act of defiance because it goes against the conventional endings of Hollywood films. Um, but no. Her act of defiance is planned for. Uh, Metzger knew the whole time that they wouldn't make it. Uh, so she starts to cry. Come back, he says. Come on. After a while, she said, I will. So that, I reread that. What is she coming back from? Just from the stage that she's in? She's saying, come back to... Come back to the world with me. <laughs> I don't know. So that's the end of chapter two. It's funny how uh, in each chapter, not very much happens, at least so far, but, but a lot is going on. <laughs> I mean, if you really just told the story straightforwardly to a friend, and it would just be a couple of sentences. She arrives in, Nar in San Narciso. San Nar Narciso. Uh, she arrives in San Narciso. She meets her uh, colleague. They have a fling, and that's it. <laughs> that's that's the whole thing. <laughs> but no. There's so much more happening. There's so much going on. There's so many connections to, to make or not make. So what do you guys so think? think? It is the how that matters, not what it is happened. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's right. I have one, uh, maybe. <laughs> it's a clever question, but have you ever been in South Narciso or... Uh... Uh, and uh, where are you living now? And uh, where are you? Uh, where are you from uh, now? Uh, uh, learn our this. Uh, take this class. But what is the, your place? Uh, uh, are you in the USA uh -huh. or? Uh... No, I'm here. I'm here in Belgrade. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm here. I've been here for a long time, as Slobodanka can tell you. I've been here for a very long time. She used to come yes. to the debate debate clubs. Way back in the day. Also, yes, and Yelena, that's right. Yes. Sorry? Right? Sorry? Something must have kept you here. Yes, well, I'm now, uh, I'm now the Z, as you say. <laughs> and uh, you uh, have ever been in, uh, in San Narciso, like a tourist or something like that? Oh, San Narciso is not a real place. Oh, I, I thought you I, were saying San Francisco. Oh, no, I, I, I think. Uh, I understand that uh, it's a real, uh, how to say, part of, uh, uh, I don't 
and in the understand that this is not exist and some uh, it is some literary form for the, no this. no no that's this is a city that's there is actually a San Narciso, but it's not in it's not in California. Oh, okay. It's in the Philippines, and it's a port, I think. Um, and it's yeah, it's named after that actual saint. No, this is just. I mean, that's. He could have just used L.A. or San Francisco, but no, no. That's why I think that that part certainly bears. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that this um, image. I think that. Uh... Uh, he uh, he took the real, <laughs> I would say, to, to uh, for the purpose of the this novel. But I didn't understand that this uh, some Im imagination, so like uh, some uh, yeah. Trafalmadors or something like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Trafalmadors. Uh, <laughs> uh, some spaceships. <laughs> maybe maybe this uh, when I uh, uh, just uh, now mentioned the. Uh, um, this uh, Trafalgarians, uh, the San Francisco, and this paranoia four miles maybe is some kind of uh, 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 how to say um, running uh, from running away from the trauma maybe and maybe uh, the way uh, like someone uh, is passing through the trauma when emotional uh, disorder uh, like uh, Edipa was. Uh, uh, passing through this uh, emotional, uh, 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 how to say, breakdowns in the relationships and maybe like uh, some in previous uh, uh, novel, uh, some, uh, this main character uh, imagine mm -hmm. on a, uh, some Trafalmador, so some non-existent forms of the life and something like that maybe it's maybe it's a sign for trauma so this paranoia or the maybe some spaceships uh, something like that i don't know um i'm reluctant to say that this is some kind of uh escape i mean it is of course in some ways an escape from that kind of feeling of being overly sheltered and not remember she described the world as not being quite in focus for her but i don't think it's because of trauma i think it's on the contrary this sort of blight of of uh boredom or at least the suspicion that the world has something else to offer that she has not been able to or she's not allowed herself to explore and so yeah she's she's going for it i mean uh this book doesn't focus on trauma the same way that the slaughterhouse five did some uh, other uh, meaning of the direction of the emotional disorder or something like I that i think the paranoia is that this uh, there's always a question of whether there's intention behind something or not and this is the kind of thing that a, a paranoiac experiences where they wonder about the intentions behind actions of other people or even the intentions behind things that they find in the world like oh i found this, this i found this thing in front of my front door and i i wonder if it means something <laughs> it does it just telling me something and uh, a paranoiac goes through that process of trying to like separate whether there's an intention whether there's a face in the bush <laughs> or not whether there's intention behind things happening to them and when a lot of coincidental things occur to someone who has paranoid ideations they begin to say this cannot be a coincidence it's too much right so i think that's the the paranoid part like all of this metzger shows up i guess the fact that he's attractive is not the coincidence part <laughs> like how can this be which is I, I thought it was kind of funny that she said he was so attractive that she thought it was a joke <laughs> anyway, that aside, just the fact that he shows up and immediately tells her about the fact that he was a child actor and they turn the TV on and it's immediately this movie with him as a child actor. So a paranoid person is forced to say, actually, even not a paranoid person could become a paranoid person in circumstances like that. It seems too much for it to be possible that that level of coincidence just occurred you would be forced to think, okay, there must be someone behind the curtain 
pulling the levers and doing this to me. Uh, so I think that that's what the, the paranoia is. And I think it's going to get you, you must agree that it is very odd to yes. such things that happen, really. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I said it would make a non-paranoid person paranoid. Uh, because it and is. It happens in life as well. Sure. It happens in life as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some I, kind of conspiration. Yes, conspiracies. See, we said at the beginning that the conspiracy would be a part of this book. Um, and that's, it's already seeping in a little bit, right? And if you think about when she first looked at the city and wondered what it had to tell her, as if there, it had secret hieroglyphic meanings, almost like etched onto it, like that circuit board, uh, that's already the beginning of it. There's something under the surface moving around. Uh, and it's the thing that she's after. Maybe it will give her that clarity that she wants, the clarity that caused her to go out on this adventure. Um, maybe it will be her ruin. Who knows? I can uh, ask you something. Um, uh, in the first chapter, uh, it, um, it uh, has a hallucination and must uh, go to the doctor hilarious. And uh, um, uh, I, I want to ask uh, when somebody has a paranoia, uh, if uh, he has uh, uh, obviously the, the some virtual visual, uh, visual hallucination, mm -hmm. uh, or, or just uh, imagine that uh, something is, uh, must be happen and that, uh, how to say immediate order like a film, like a movie, a baby girl, and just uh, like uh, when the Metzger uh, came on the door, on the, some how to say imagine imaginable uh, imaginary. order of uh, imaginary imaginary order of uh, some uh, situation that it must be happen or uh, something like uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, are you are you asking whether the whole thing is perhaps a hallucination? Is that what you're asking? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, is that is is this whole some kind of a, a visual or a hallucination? Or some some kind. I don't know. It's not exactly hallucination, but something hallucinatory maybe. vision of the text. Uh, maybe so. I mean, again, I think that. I mean, my opinion on that is that no, it's not. I think that it's, uh, I think it's supposed to, it's a sort of like cosmic weirdness revealing. So there is some cosmic force at work, right? Uh, so there is something behind it. And it's just this, like I said, the high cosmic weirdness <laughs> is behind it. I don't think I personally don't think that it's a hallucination. Um, although it's quite possible that aspects of it, I think it's quite possible that aspects of it are at least exaggerated to them. Um, but to a person who is paranoid and having hallucinations, you know, they, they could fixate upon something and it can seem like something else completely. So maybe the answer is somewhere in between. In fact, you could even argue that, well, our entire perception of the world is, in fact, uh, a hallucination. I mean, <laughs> that's true on a basic neurological level, that our experience of reality is, is a complex hallucination uh, put together by our brains from our senses. Uh, I mean, that's one way of looking. So like, what is not a hallucination is the better question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when the weird, high, the high weirdness pokes through, that's where the hallucination is actually breaking down. Chew on that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Vasilia, you had something to ask. I'm sorry. Well, yes. San uh, Narciso, uh, uh, it is a, a town, a fictive town in southeast, in South California. South uh, from uh, LA. It's not a real town, though. It's not a real town that yes, exists. Yes. Uh, no, yes, fictional. Fictional yeah, town, yeah. Yes, and uh, fiction town. Uh, and uh, I noticed 
uh, uh, the script what you sent, but uh, there are there are lot of mention of uh, South uh, Californian um, talk how it is. Uh, uh, Thomas Pynchon criticized the South uh, Californian um, what, um, society. Uh, he's uh, criticizing I, South California society. I think he's certainly criticizing an aspect of California. Um, I haven't read too deeply on Pynchon's biography, but I did read that he spent some time among the hippies and with the hippie and sort of beat movements and kind of came away with it feeling a little bit uh, um, disillusioned, <laughs> maybe a little bit dispirited by the whole thing. Or like he didn't, he didn't, he was certainly influenced by the hippie movement. So that would be, I mean, the epicenter of the hippie movement uh, was San Francisco. Uh, at right around that time that this book was written. So he's got to be thinking about that to some extent. And I've also read though that he really considers himself a real Californian. So it's gotta be one of those things where, you know, uh, it, it's a love-hate relationship perhaps. <laughs> um, but I don't think he's necessarily just targeting California, uh, but rather kind of, materialistic life in general that's certainly not exclusive to california even though you know we're all inclined to think of hollywood and los angeles uh as sort of paragons of material materialist and material ambitions let's say um but yeah i don't know if he's specifically targeting southern Ca like I'm thinking about it now. I haven't spent much time in, in California. I've, I've been able to visit San Diego and San Francisco and very briefly LA. My sister lived in San Diego for a while. Um, and it is true that, okay, this is also just what I've heard from other Californians that there is kind of a Southern Californian culture that's separate from <laughs> Central and Northern California. It's a long state. So naturally, there would be some different cultural uh, sort of conglomerations <laughs> over that large a space. But California is huge. It's uh, like the economy of California is as large as the entire country of France's economy. Anyway, that's a, that's a sidetrack. I don't know why I'm going that direction. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see how that goes forward. Again, I don't think that it's specifically him criticizing California, although California is standing in for, for something. But when you uh, say California, uh, you, uh, in some uh, case, can, uh, can remind of some Silicon Valley or something like that, something weird, something a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, Strange culture, maybe uh, too open-minded, free, and uh, maybe this uh, behavior on uh, that MS. Maybe, is that, uh, and maybe we we should connect with some this hippie movement, uh, like the, it is to uh, uh, to reach some freedom to in this in, in her relationship and uh, in her behavior, maybe. Maybe uh, it's a sign of this Californian life style. Maybe something like that. No. Maybe in some, in some, in some, in some, uh, some. I don't know. Maybe I, I, I personally don't think that, but it, perhaps. I mean, I, I really don't think that it's about California. I mean, there is a lot, perhaps, to say about the kind of. Uh, Uh, inconsistencies or internal conflicts of California that went from, like you mentioned Silicon Valley, which actually has been around for quite a bit longer than people realize, but uh, not quite in the form as we see it today. It exists, well, around the time that he made this. He does mention this weapons manufacturing company and a, 
uh, in the US, a lot of those companies did uh, have uh, facilities there in California. So let's say it's a land of contradictions. <laughs> Giant weapons corporations in California, the land of the hippie movement, like where it started. I think maybe he would like to point out contradictions to us. Uh, I don't think he's, I, I don't think that he's uh, moralizing about, about Oedipus behavior. I certainly don't think that, but he might be, but I, I don't pick it up that way myself. You want to emphasize, want to emphasize uh, 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 her behavior a uh, lot. Uh, he just wa want, uh, wants like that to describe this, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to exaggerate the, the, the whole, uh, let's say, paranoid uh, uh, let's say, behavior. She, uh, he, I don't even just, think we've. I don't think we've gotten to the real paranoia yet. I think the the story is just getting started. Uh, you ain't seen nothing yet, as they say. <laughs> I mean, when you say em emphasize her behavior, I, I I don't even. I'm not sure what the word emphasize is doing there. Like so far, yeah. I mean, she's made some decisions that some of us might not, but it's nothing like extremely like insane or anything like that. You know, it's. Uh, perhaps unusual, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I don't think we've gotten to the real paranoia yet. I think we're going to, we're going to see more of that later. It's just, we're just starting to, right. We're just starting to see the little glimpses of that. Hippie moment. Uh, uh, does uh, have some con connection with hip hop music? It's no. Similar. Well, okay. there is an, there is an etymological connection. Uh, because there's the word hip, and the word hip, it's not only the buka, what is that? It's not only the body part, uh, it's also uh, hip means cool, and it came from hippies. So there's a linguistic connection. Hip comes from hippie, so hip is cool. Hey, man, that's really hip. Uh, doesn't mean like, hey, man, that's the part of the body where your leg connects to your pelvis. <laughs> it means, hey, man, that's really cool. Uh, and yeah, it's short for hippie. So hip hop has that linguistic connection. Of, it's not to be directly translated, though, as cool hop. <laughs> and what does green hop? Hop, hop, hop. Hop means jump. Jump. Yeah. Um, uh, we can translate a uh, cool jump. <laughs> Cool jump. Word, 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 cool jump. It certainly it doesn't it doesn't work for direct translation, but uh, it's not uh, like but, uh, something. Words they travel, they pick up little bits of other things, meanings accumulate to them. They get processed by different groups of people and go into different forms of use, and they can come out the other side completely changed. Um, that happens all the time. In fact, it's a never-ending process. All right. Well, uh, next time we'll talk about chapter three. Um, I am trying to fit in like this, this circle of the hero's journey. I'm putting like a little piece of it up each time. Last time was the call to adventure. I guess, I guess that uh, Metzger is supernatural aid <laughs> or a guardian of the threshold. Yes, Vasilia. Uh, and a uh, saint Narcissus, uh, it is a saint. And I didn't understand when you talked about uh, saint Narcissus, the saint, about fl flies. Uh, uh huh. Something. So there's a there's a Catalonian saint called Saint Narcissus. There are two Saint Nar Narcissus. There are two Saint Narcisses. <laughs> That's sorry. Uh, one of them is a Catalonian saint. Um, he's the patron saint of biting insects. So he's supposed to protect you from like mosquitoes and so on. Um, but the reason is that uh, his body is in a town in Catalonia. Now. 
the legend goes that when the French tried to invade that town uh, out of the church where his body is kept, a swarm of flies came and defended the city against the French invaders. They bit the how, French. How did they do that? They're how biting. They, do that? they were biting flies. Apparently, like, do you know what a horse fly is? It's yes, a, it, yes, yes. And I mean the biting kind. It's not. Uh, it won't kill you or anything, but it's certainly annoying. And if you had thousands of them on you, well, that would just not be. I mean, apparently it was a very large swarm. But look, guys, I mean, this is <laughs> this is a a legend. Um, I don't think it has to. I, I, should we ask uh, how long were the flies? <clears throat> what exact species of fly? Well, I think it's you know it's a legend. <laughs> I mean, you could imagine it working. If there were enough flies, you wouldn't be able to breathe. <laughs> and uh, there were three invasion attempts. And in the second one, the flies just bit the horses and the horses ran away. So that worked. You see the flies, they were getting smarter. <laughs> um, but in that town, I've forgotten the name of the town. There are statues of flies everywhere. Like on the buildings, you can find just flies large flies, concrete ones, and marble ones just carved into the buildings. So that, that was the story. But yeah, there's oh, an old, the original Saint Narcissus is uh, oh. a saint who, a li who lived very long. <laughs> he didn't get martyred. This other one got martyred. Who got martyred? Uh, the second one. Who the was second, martyred? The second saint. Uh, the one with flies. The one with the flies, yes. He was... so, excuse me, may I ask you, so uh, are you arguing that the, the imaginary town was named after the saint? That uh, he... No. The, no. The actual saint? No, I, I, I don't actually think that. I just thought it was an interesting connection. <laughs> and may, I don't know. I haven't finished okay. the book yet. If there are some biting flies in the book at some point, then I might have to revise my opinion. <laughs> like I, I'm waiting to see. So I thought about it because it is the town is San Narcissa. So it, that's Saint, right? Saint Narcissa. So it's literally Saint Nar Narcissa. Uh, so it might have some reference to that to that saint with the biting flies or the original one. Who knows? If anybody lives to be a hundred. Sorry. Uh, that legend about uh, uh, martyred saint. Uh, in which in which century it was that legend? Uh, I think that is the sixth century or fifth century. I I can't remember immediately, but it's around there. Maybe it's eighth. I, I actually I'm completely lost on the date, to be honest. Dates are popping into my head right now, but I'm not sure if any of them are accurate. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry if I, uh, uh, if I stopped you in your talk. No, no, that's it. We're, we're actually done for now. Um, I hope you guys will come back next week for the discussion of Chapter 3. We'll see where this thing goes. And uh, again, if you want me... Or if you have any suggestions or things that you would like to include in the conversation, just send me an email and uh, I'll put it on a slide and we can bring it up. Okay. In that case, okay. until next time, hope you guys have a good week. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye to everyone. Goodbye to everyone. Bye bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.